Hi there, friends. Welcome to another TechSoup Connect event. My name is Eli, and I'm one of the co-hosts, along with Ben, for the TechSoup Connect Western Canada chapter. Today, we're going to talk about how to fundraise with AI marketing. This session is going to focus on AI technologies and tools that simplify the creation and personalization of fundraising content, giving nonprofits like yourself the superpower to amplify the reach by 100 plus. From AI images to videos and songs to multilingual content and avatars, you're going to learn everything you need to use AI to stand out in the digital space. And as a repeat expert, I'm delighted that we have Deepa Chowdhury here for with us. Deepa is the founder of Grantor, which is an AI-powered grant writer. She comes from a, non, a nonprofit background with expertise in fundraising and helping nonprofits embrace technology. Previously, she worked with the Salesforce Foundation and was part of the founding team of United Way in Mumbai. You're going to learn a lot. And with that, I'm going to go and pass the baton over to Deepa. So I am one of you. I come from a nonprofit background. I have founded teams and organizations when really young, especially United Way Mumbai, where it was just two of us that took the organization from two employees to 50 plus employees that United Way Mumbai has today. And I've struggled a lot with uh, being a small team and managing tons of stuff. So AI gives nonprofits and nonprofit professionals superpowers to do a lot with very few resources. And that's why I'm very excited about AIs. I've also previously worked with Salesforce Foundation and have been helping nonprofits embrace technology from the early days of cloud, going from being just having everything on a desktop to having things in the cloud so we can have more mobility about how we access work and where we can contribute from. I've seen that phase as well in terms of helping nonprofits use technology. And I know that technology is very hard to embrace. And so what I really like about AI is that it's a very simple tool. Like it's a very simple tech. You don't have to do much. It just does things for you. It's very magical. So these are the two things that I'm really excited and bullish about and I. And I would love that more and more nonprofits use AI in their work daily. That's my objective. I currently run a startup. It's an AI first startup called Grant Orb, and we help nonprofits write grants quickly. Uh, we started as just being able to write grants, but now we also do grant reporting. If you need to report on grants, you can go from loose thoughts, somewhere you put down your thoughts, you want to generate a really great impact report, you can do it in five minutes or 10 minutes maximum. You can also find grants on a platform. So we've just gone from just simply being a tool for writing grants to discovery, discovering grants, writing grants and reporting on grants. So our goal is to really enable nonprofits to do that part. And it's also one of the most time consuming part of a nonprofit organization. That's a little bit about me, but I'm really excited about, as I said, AI, and I would want to dive into the fundamentals of this new AI wave that you must be hearing everywhere, like the term AI, like people just use, keep using the word AI, 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 it's become like a buzzword, but what does it really mean? So this current wave of AI is all about generative AI, which is powered by large language models. So previously AI existed before 2022, before chat GPT came out, it existed before as well, but as end users, we played very little role in that AI. It was more about machine learning, right? It was more about if you're on Amazon and if we bought like a uh, few things, then Amazon can predict what are the next few things we're going to buy and it'll push those items in front of us. Or if we've watched like a couple of movies on Netflix, then Netflix knows our taste and will recommend more movies related to the ones uh, we've watched previously. So it's more about optimizing what the user wants, but we never got to interact with that technology. But this AI, since ChatGPT, that really made AI available to the millions in 2022, it's not even, I think it was late November 22nd or 24th when they launched it and we all, the very first time experienced ChatGPT, which is basically just a chat interface to a large language model. So it's AI model that's trained on all of internet's knowledge and also knowledge that is being created off the internet. There are villages and there are towns that are just creating 
data for these models and there's synthetic data. So there's tons of data that's being packed into these models. And this model is like a human brain, but because it's a machine brain, it can do things faster than human beings can do. So it can create new content based on all the knowledge that it has. And it can create content in different formats, not just text, but also images, video, music, voice. And so how does generative AI work? Like these models, you've heard of ChatGPT, but the company behind ChatGPT is OpenAI and they have different models. Like they launched in 2022 with GPT-3, which they've retired now. And they have new models like GPT-4 and O1. Uh, so they train on tons and tons of data and the, the training is very, after that, it's just serving the data to us, inference, that's what it's called, but I won't go into too much technical details, but it costs millions to train. Facebook is doing it, Meta as they call themselves now. It's an open source model, they're training one. X, which is run by Elon Musk, Twitter formerly, is also training their own model names. Google, for instance, they have Gemini, they're all training these huge models because it is very expensive to train and people like you and me, it's impossible. We don't have that much money to even get the GPUs. The GPU provided by NVIDIA, it is the most the rare commodity now that these people are fighting to get it because the production capacity is limited and all these companies need GPUs to train these models. As Andre Karpathy, he was the founding team of OpenAI and also the head of Tesla AI research. He caught, the way he describes it, these models is think of them as a zip file of the internet. Whatever we put on the internet since the very start of the internet has been packed into these models. Everything obviously, which is public in public uh, domain. So AI is a multi-model, which basically means that AI understands all forms of communication because now these models can speak human language and it's very technical. We don't even need that user interface anymore. In the future, we can do almost everything through voice command. We can just say, hey, book me an Uber and the Uber will the, it'll say, okay, it's five minutes away. Where do you want to go? And you can just do it through voice and things will happen magically for us. That's the future. Actually, there is no user interface that's going to be in the future, but we are slowly making progress towards that. And it can understand all forms of communications. You can show an image and then you can ask an AI, tell me about this image or based on this image, write me a poem, for instance, and I'll be able to do that. So it can perform different tasks. And the way it works is the text, image, video, music, all of these, they enter as tokens and the output comes out as tokens. So it's very technical. I won't go into the details, but the model, the brain inside just understands the language of tokens and the tokens, they multiply and they pop out something, which we basically make use of. Now, this is something that we all have interacted with. Obviously, ChatGPT was the very first one to come out in 2022, but after ChatGPT, it drew the attention of almost all the big tech giants and they saw that there is potential in this. So it's not that ChatGPT was the very first one to train the AI model. Meta had trained it even before ChatGPT and Google has been in this domain forever. But these models were not, we couldn't interact in human language with these models. So what ChatGPT's contribution, the biggest contribution has been is to train and fine tune these models in a way that humans can interact and get stuff done, whatever it is, get knowledge, get tasks done. And that's what we all experienced for the very first time two years ago in November through ChatGPT. But now Google has Gemini, Meta AI has their model integrated into WhatsApp. So it's available to inside WhatsApp. And what I really like about Meta is that it's open source. And also it's already, because it's part of WhatsApp, people from so many different countries where WhatsApp is really popular, like in most of the emerging markets, like Brazil and India and uh, Vietnam, they can access, uh, you know, all of those expertise in their language. They don't have to really talk in English. They can talk in their local language and get answers in their local language. Claude is uh, another one that I love. I absolutely love Claude. I started using like with ChatGPT, but I'm like leaning more towards Claude because it is more human-like. So talk with this chatbot. Grok is absolutely great. It's trained on all of the data on Twitter. And it, it is great to know the sentiments. Like today, if you want to know the sentiments of what's happening in the U.S. elections and people are always tweeting, live tweeting, and it can give you a whole sentiment report based on just 
very real-time information as of one minute ago what happened and in a great summary format. In fact, before BC elections, I just asked Croft to tell me what are all the parties and what are the agenda and the policies and just did a deep research. Uh, a lot of people share their views and opinions on X and news links, so stuff like that. Perplexity is another one which is great for research uh, and you can access different chatbots, like three or four different chatbots through just one application, which is called Perplexity. These are all the chatbots, uh, but AI can do more than just chatting. It can create visuals. And these are different tools that are there. It can create visuals and it can create videos and it can create songs and it can do many more things. First, we have to see here, Dali, Midjourney, Grok. Grok is great. As I said, I not only use Grok to do all my research, but I also use it to create images and it creates really photorealistic images. And it's powered by an open source model, image model called Flux. Midjourney is great. Delhi's Insight Chat GPT Runway ML is great for creating videos. So soon we'll be able to create Hollywood style videos just sitting on a laptop. We don't need a huge production budget or we don't need big teams. We can just, as nonprofit professionals, be able to create really captivating videos just from our device. And music is new. I'm loving that because music was never part of a communication strategy, but I just feel like music is so nice. Like it's, it's a great way to communicate your cause and we can use, create different jingles and stuff and put it with, if you're creating a video, just use that jingle for any video that we're creating. So it's amazing. So how do now nonprofits market with AI, right? So much of the work that we do is about communicating a cause to everybody. There's so many different touch points. We communicate with donors all the time, with the board members, with volunteers, with our beneficiaries, people that we are helping, right? We want to communicate our why, for instance, hand washing is important. And so visuals play a really big part in what we do as nonprofit organizations. Uh, and so do uh, words. And you need to be really compelling and impactful in your messaging, because if you're boring, they will not read, right? It really helps us elevate the way we communicate. And today I'm going to take you through some of the new ways that you can probably, you know, at the end of the session, my goal is that you'll be able to be a one person studio doing, creating different styles of visuals and music and uh, whatever is needed for your organization to be able to effectively communicate the cause. So AI images, I'm a big fan of this because as I said, I've always worked in small teams and uh, with limited budget. And uh, my biggest challenge was being able to communicate my cause visually. Like I never had the money to get someone to do it for us. And whatever job that I did really badly, any graphics that I created were bad. And I bet this is a problem with many nonprofits, right? I, I'm great at writing grants, but I couldn't create visuals for my impact report or for my mailers that I'm sending out. That was always a challenge. And for me, the biggest unlock is that I'm able to create stunning visuals. Any concept that I have in my mind, I am able to now bring it to life. And I can bring it to life instantly in microseconds. And if I don't like it, I can iterate on it really fast. Like it takes me microseconds to iterate on my concept. This is what something I was doing for my blog. I wanted to create an image and show a farmer kind of thing. And I began with the, and it did, obviously didn't like it. And then I evolved my prompt to get this. And the best part about Midney is it always gives you four options. And you can choose from one of those four options, whichever one you think is best. Another thing that I like about Midjourney, like, so Midjourney is like an image creation tool, is that you can also see the images of what others are creating and you can get inspired by those. And if you like what any of the image that the others have created, you can use that prompt, you can reuse that prompt and you will get something similar, but a different image. So you're not really copying. It's like really collective. Uh, basically we're building on each other's expertise in a way because my images get shared and if somebody likes, they can reuse the prompt and I can reuse somebody else's prompt. And it's a very soul experience. And you can create many styles. You don't have to stick to the traditional styles that you can choose like an anime style or a cartoon style or uh, pixel art because now we have the power to create it, different ways of communicating our cause. 
a prompt really matters. So if you really want good control over the output and you don't want to be like an AI slop, like there's so many images now that get shared. But a lot of them, you can look at the image and, ah, oh, it's AI and it's not really that great. But if you want to really want your content to stand out, then you have to be able to prompt it better because what you say is what the AI generates. And obviously photographers and artists can do a much better job because they already know how to instruct. They will just say, make it wide angle or close up or put more technical terms around their skills and AI keeps that, takes that information and then generates an image based on that. So they have an advantage, but you still can gain that advantage through a lot of practice. And I'm going to share a few tricks how else. So these are the different tools that are available for creating images. Midjourney is my absolute favorite. And the second absolute favorite is Grok. Grok is, as I said, is part of X. It's inside the app. And if you are a paid member, it's free for you. You don't have to pay extra for using the AI. You can do all your research and you can create images. That's why I like Grok a lot. I can do so many things in one app. And Ideogram is another one, of which is, again, a very social experience like Midjourney. And ChatGPT has Delhi inside, it, so you can create. Lately, I'm not finding Delhi to be that creative. Create the Midjourney or the Grok photorealistic thing. Bing is powered by Delhi, and um, there are many more. Uh, but these are my absolute favorite. I obviously started with Chat, started in Midjourney, but now I'm Midjourney Grog and sometimes Ideogram I use. And I bet Gemini also has a image creation model. And so these are all the different images that I have created. I have a folder on my desktop. It just says AI images because I create so many. If your cause is about wildlife, you can create really stunning visuals. This is something that I created about Grand Tour. It just gives you that kind of acceleration because you don't have to spend hours now writing Grand. And this was a cartoon style. This is a really photorealistic image that I created. Uh, so the whole idea is that you're not limited by your ability. You can do anything literally you want and anything you visualize, you can now bring it to life. The, uh, the art is obviously uh, being able to describe what's in your mind to the AI. Because if the more detailed the description is, the better the output is going to be. This one, as I said, is really photorealistic. And I used my journey to create that. This, I didn't even think so much about the prompt. I was just playing around with ChatGPT and it really did a great job. In Furco, I really got a good image and I didn't bother to iterate on it. I'll be more strategic about it. For instance, how to create epic AI images. These are the things that I do. Reuse prompts, both, as I said, Midjourney and Ideogram is a social experience. If you are inspired by somebody else's image, see the prompt that they've used and reuse that prompt. It will not be an identical image, but you keep that information in mind, the prompt information in mind in creating the image that you liked, something similar. I use AI to craft prompts. So for instance, if I have a concept in my mind, I use ChatGPT or Claude to discuss that concept in great details. And then at the end of it, I say, okay, now help me craft image prompt description. And I take that description because it's already been uh, ChatGPT and Claude knows the conversation I had with them. And then I tell them to uh, give me a prompt description. I take that description, I put it into Midjourney or Grok. And then I create the image. And so the output is 100 times better than me just saying, create uh, an image of cat flying. You need to be, give more details. And sometimes I even ask them to prompt me the details around camera angle. And so it'll say aerial view if I want. If they don't put a camera angle sometimes, but if I have something in my mind that it has to be a front-facing image or back-facing, I ask the chat bot to even suggest the camera angle that's best and it'll suggest and I put that in the prompt. And I go create it. So it really uh, gives you a lot of control over the output. Uh, so use AI to optimize your prompts too. So for instance, if you already have a broken prompt in your mind, because AI can, you don't have to frame full sentences. You can just say cat flying in the jungle or cat flying jungle. That will also work and it'll create a cat flying in the jungle. But if you want to optimize it, then use AI and again, put it in, when I say use AI, use the chatbot like Claude or Gemini or ChatGPT and put those three words or four, your concept there and tell it to optimize it. Say, I'm going to be using an AI to uh, create an image, help me make this better. And trust me, all of this takes not more than five minutes, actually. So if you put a prompt in the mid journey, all done in five minutes, you can even iterate. It's all seconds we are talking about and it's impossible for human beings to be able to 
output anything at such a fast rate. And this is another great feature, image analysis, because these chatbots can see, Cloud can see, ChatGPT can see. Grok recently introduced image analysis too, even if you insert a picture in Grok. It can tell you about that picture. I wrote an article on AI and democracy, and I wanted an image for that article. So I had a chat with ChatGPT. And I said, because Athens is like the house for direct democracy. So I said, I want like a mix of modern and ancient. And based on that, after my discussion, I said, okay, help me craft a prompt. And this is the prompt it gave me. It was a pretty long prompt. It's literally like a story. And I actually posted this image with this prompt because it's such a great story that it just worked with that itself. Even if you don't have a full blog post, just a little blurb and the image, you can tell great stories. So talking about image analysis, this is the image that I took at the time. This incident happened, and because I know an image is like, a tells a thousand words what happened, I put it and I said, what story does this image tell? Basically in ChatGPT, this was in ChatGPT. And it depicted like the image, I didn't say anything else. I said, what story does this image tell? And it said this shows former president Donald Trump being surrounded by Secret Service agents. So it's got like this really sharp vision. It can see things and it can tell you what's happened in that image, which is a very powerful tool. And I'm going to show you how you can put that image analysis into practice at your nonprofit. So in, for marketing, for instance, like I use this all the time. Like, as I said, I create a lot of AI images and when I want to use a, an image for my blog post, I actually show the chatbot, Claude or ChatGPT, two or three images that I have in mind. And I say, this is the article that I'm writing. Tell me which is better suited for this article. And ChatGPT will rank the images saying this one, all the images are great, but I think the first one is great or the third one is great because this exactly depicts what this is and the lighting is great and ta -da. so you, if you want to really optimize the impact or whatever you're doing and we have these tools that can then can help us optimize in seconds and we should definitely make use of it so i do this a lot for all my all not all my blog posts but a few of my blog posts when i have more than i'm confused i like both the images but now i want to consult the ai and see which one the ai thinks is better then i just do that Analyze images and suggest best images to use. So you can use, do this for your website, your promotional materials, your reports, like you're writing impact reports. And it doesn't have to be AI generated images. You can feed in the images that you have of your people or any graphics that you have and say, which one will resonate better. And you can describe, provide more context. Say your demographic is this, or the audience is this, which one will resonate better if I show you three images and the AI will tell you which one would be a better one. And you can use image analysis to create impactful captions too. For like, you show an image and say, help me craft a caption, like a one line, a one word or one sentence or a motivational quote. And we need that all the time, right? We are in the business of inspiring people and we need that. And you can use your images or your graphics to help AI. When I say AI, I'm talking about chatbots to help you generate captions. And use AI to analyze inspiring visuals. Like I'm on the road and I'm walking around in Vancouver and I see something great. I always take a picture. Like I've always done this since my nonprofit days that anything that inspired me, I would take pictures. But I had the difficulty of reproducing that because I am not uh, an artistic person. But now I can. So what I do is I just show it to the chatbot and say, tell me about the font size. Tell me about what font they use. Tell me about the colors, the gradient, this, that. And then I use that information to go and create a similar visual, which is like that, but it's not exactly that, but it's similar to that. So it's really great. This is an image that I created and I fed this into Claude this morning. And I said, give me three inspiring quotes based on this image. And it gave me three. If you ask for 10, I'll give you 10. And if you're using multiple chatbots, like if you're using Gemini and ChatGPT, Gemini is free, by the way. So if you're in Google Docs or if you use Gmail, Gemini is free. So you can take the output of one chatbot and put it into the other chatbot and say, hey, rank this. And it's all about optimizing and seeing what really clicks. And they can rank it and say, I think the third one is the best code for this. So you can do that kind of sampling as well with chatbots if you have access to multiple. 
this is an organization that I know that has been actively using AI images from early days. They do publishes for social entrepreneurs all around the world, and they use AI art to inspire people to learn more about these pop-up villages. So AI Music Lab created the song. I, w- I won't play the song, but this is like a grant up song that I created. I have not thought of creating songs, but because I'm surrounded with AI engineers all the time, I was writing down all the key characteristics of grant up. Like you don't need to be a, a grant writing expert or you don't need to do eligibility check. And I had written it down and they're like, why don't we just put this in uh, Claude and ask it to generate lyrics? Uh, and it generated lyrics and then I took Suno, which is Suno.ai is a music generation site. I put it into Suno and it created the music. And then I wanted a really good image, like a good cover for my music. So I went to Mid Journey and I described what I wanted and I created an image. The only time it took me to really bring this to life and share it in public was to stitch all of this together because I got an audio file and I can't share audio file on LinkedIn. So I had to stitch the image and the audio files and I use CapCut for it. And I think that took me 15 minutes, but everything else was like relatively fast. Oh, th- these were the lyrics it created. Create like a rap style song for me and Claude created it in seconds. In fact, I think this was my third version. I didn't like the first two. So I just uh, said, gave more instructions. And this was the third one. I put it into Suno and it created two songs for me. And I chose the one that I really liked. And again, you can ask Claude to even recommend music style. Like if you have a certain genre in mind, then you can ask them to give you specifics like you want a trap hook or a rap or 60s hip hop or whatever. Ask the chatbot to recommend the music style. And then in Suno, you can put the music style and the lyrics and it'll create it for you. This is the one that I created this morning. And maybe I can play this one. AI. But fire your impact, watch your world supply. Doing more AI and no profits a powerful AI. I liked it. So this I created this morning, actually. Again, I explained the concept to chatbots, like how AI can enable nonprofits and, you know, how they're always bogged down with so much work and not getting time for their mission. It actually gave me a, a much longer, like with the whole uh, words and the chorus and everything. I just took a little bit of it. I put into Suno.ai, there are two music generation services, and then you describe the style you want, which I said trap hook and melodic and electronic, and it just created the song in three minutes or so. The last one that I wanted, I'm very excited about videos, like the ability to create Hollywood style videos, but that technology is still very nascent. Like you can't create more than two minutes or three minutes of video. So I I don't want to uh, dive into that one today, but Today, I want to talk about how I create my product videos. As I said, we are an AI first startup and I use AI for everything. Like a logo is created by AI. All the images that we use is created by AI. And this is a video that I created on right around triple 10 minutes. Like it's a picture, but I trained the AI on my voice. So it is my voice, but the AI makes my eyes blink, my lips sync to the text. And I didn't have to do anything to create this video, basically. Like, I didn't have to record it. All I had to do was provide my image and then the text, of which I could edit on the side. And I can even reduce my speech. Like, if I'm talking too fast, I can say 0.5 or 0.1. So it makes it very legible. And I can even create these videos in 50 different languages if I want. Or I can have it in British accent or American accent or Canadian accent. Like it just enables really high level of personalization. Write, write grant reports in minutes with Grant Orr, the state of the art AI grant writer. Grant reports that impress. Select the grant report from the drop down menu in the grant wizard. You- so this is, I, I create all my videos like this and The only time consuming part is actually taking screenshots. But now that I've trained the AI on my voice and I have given it my image, I don't have to sit in front of the camera all the time and spend enormous amount of time just recording and then post editing. That's time consuming too. Like I've produced podcasts and I know how much time it takes to edit. You can do the same in your organization. You want to create a video 
for your volunteers, you want to give them any specific instructions or you want for your website, if, uh, you want to help them better navigate the website, you can create videos like this and you can create it at scale. You don't have to have a live person for this. You can use your image and animate your image. And even if you don't want to animate, there are avatars available. You can use those avatars. There, there's so many options. So this is basically my workflow in back. Like my screenshots are bad, but actually this is how it looks. Like you choose a template and then you put your text and you edit your text. And so whatever text I put gets converted into speech. It's called text to speech. And I can, if I want to pause between sentences or after words, there's a pause bubble I can put. I can try, I have this in any accent I want. I can have it in any language I want. It is remarkable. And it really saves me a lot of time from being, just setting up the camera and looking good. <laughs> Sometimes you're so in the work, it takes time to do all of that. But yeah, this is my last fit. My message to everyone is that AI is really uh, a revolutionary technology. Uh, and I feel totally empowered as a social entrepreneur. I'm able to do things so much faster, creating visuals and then edit, creating videos and editing it and uh, doing it in a small budget. Like it has always been a big challenge for me and AI has been truly liberating as a tool. And I use it every day. I have a team of AI engineers. And in my startup, our rule is that we need to ask AI first. And that's how I got into the habit of using AI for everything. Initially with ChatGPT, I almost gave up because it wasn't sometimes giving things the way I wanted. But when you want ChatGPT and all to do a certain task, because they're not trained for tasks. We, Grant Orb is trained to write grants. So it's really good at writing grants. ChatGPT is not trained at writing grants. And so sometimes even if you try to use them, it might not do the way you want it, it to be. So it was initially frustrating and I almost gave up using these chatbots and my AI engineers are like, before you come to us for anything, you're going to ask AI first. And if the AI doesn't satisfy your answers or whatever, then you come to us. So that's how I got into the habit. And now I chat with AI more then I chat with humans in my day, day to day. Like it's either the AI or the people or grant drop users. These are the only two people that I chat with. Uh, so do it with AI. Like anything that you're doing, think with AI, create with AI. Like you need to really build this AI muscle because the more you build it, the more you will naturally move towards it. We have all these amazing tools available, but very few nonprofits today are using these tools because we've not built our AI muscle. We, by default, go back to our old ways of doing things when we have better ways of doing things now. So I think initially it might be uh, something you need to put a conscious effort towards that, okay, I've got to use this or have some policies around ask AI first. Like that really helps because AI has all the answers in the world. You don't have to ask the next the person next to you. Just ask the AI. And the more you use these chatbots, the more you use these uh, image generation or video generation tools, the better you'll get. There is no shortcut to it. So that's my only message. Awesome. Thank you so much, Deepa. That's really helpful to give us a, a good foundation. First question is, what's your primary tech stack of AI tools? What are the four you come to most often? So I use... Claude, a lot. I use Claude. I use Midjourney. I use Grok because Grok, I, I'm on X. I'm pretty active on Twitter. I use Grok for image generation. Like yesterday, I was replying to somebody's tweet. I just quickly went inside Grok and created an image and responded with an image. So obviously, Claude, Grok. So Grok is also like a chatbot, but it is real time. So it will. it's great for research. So when I do research for my articles, I want to know the statistics. How many people live at the base of the pyramid? Four billion people. Grok is amazing because it'll give you real time information. What are the climate events that has happened as of today? It'll give you everything about it, which ChatGPT or Claude can't give you. So these two for sure. Then I use HeyGen for creating my videos, my product videos that I need for Grant Orbs. And Grant Orb, I've written, like I had to apply. The application was as complicated and as cumbersome as a grant application. And I use Grant Orb to write it. These are, this is what I would suggest. In the future, you might want to add, and Suno. Suno is great. 
And by the way, I would want to say that almost all of these tools give you free credits right now. They're giving you free credits because they want you to try it out. So you make use of those free credits. They will give you daily credits or monthly credits. So Suno is they give you free credits. Ideogram gives you free credits. I tried Ideogram. I didn't stick to it, but it's again like mid-journey social experience of creating images. So you might want to try Ideogram and it is, as I said, they give you free credits. But I pay for mid-journey. I pay for Grok. I pay for Claude. I also have ChatGPT because I wanted to try out their superior models. They came out with really superior models, which they said it helps with reasoning. I tried to reason with it, but I like Claude more. So I'm still paying for ChatGPT. I might just discontinue ChatGPT. It's not in my uh, scheme of things anymore. They also have Delhi inside ChatGPT, which can create images, but it's not the best image creation model. It is not. And the reasoning, the most superior model, which they say has PhD level intelligence is not, I didn't like it that much. I I prefer Claude these days. And that really actually, you touched the next question from Michael Brown, which is, are any of these image video generation tools free to nonprofits? And it sounds like all of them have at least enough credits for you to go in and determine whether it's gotten value to you as an organization. Yes. Like mid journey is paid, but there are mid journey has different uh, levels. You can buy the lowest level where they will put you in the slow creation. Like if you don't urgently need it, then you can use that level. Then it'll basically, it'll be priced low. So mid journey is paid, but Grok, if you have a blue check mark on uh, X, which is basically the way to authenticate, it's not a bot. You pay and use X services. Then Grok comes free with it. And the Grok's image generation it's amazing. And the way you can edit prompts and hit next, sometimes I end up creating, I, I feel bad because I'm wasting compute, but I sometimes end up creating 15 images. <laughs> yes. And I keep iterating on my prompt. But as I said, I, I shared some tools, uh, like techniques of how to optimize a prompt. If you do your homework, like use one of the chatbots to optimize the prompt, then you don't have to do too many times hit next and create. Great. So I've got a related image, a question around images, which is how do you think about and handle image rights and is that a concern when we're working with these generative ai tools so the if you're paying for the services the images you belong to you you th- these are your images you have the right to use it the only thing that i want to be more conscious about as a social entrepreneur is when you're using image absolute photorealistic images of because we work with people right and uh, if you're in an environment go ahead and create this any env- if you're wwf or greenpeace or whatever can use this image right act now and you're not going to go and do a close-up shot of an animal you can create cheetahs and you can create forests and those are really great in fact you don't want to use real photography there you might want to just use ai images for that but when it comes to people i might want to just create one photorealistic image that really represents my organization for instance that can be my model for everything so it is my talking head for everything basically Mm -hmm. and that is one image that i might want to create that just truly represents the values of my organization but I don't want to create uh, big images of kids and stuff like that. Like something like those are ethical questions that you might want to deal at your organization level. Like how comfortable do you feel doing that? I don't feel comfortable doing that. But if I'm creating a video, an AI video, soon enough we will be by next year creating AI videos. And sometimes the uh, production costs are so high, taking a cameraman and this and that and post editing and all that. You might want to create some stock images using these AI image generation models or your real images and then create a video out of that, basically. I think it really does come to the organization and their values and their priorities. And I'm dropping a link into the chat from TechSoup about some guidance on how to create a generative AI use policy. So guides your organization through some of the questions to ask around where do you feel comfortable? Where, where what are the parameters and guidance around that? In the image world, I've got a question here from Lisa who says, what do you think is best for that kind of imagery? Actually, Grok is pretty good. And the one that I have it in my presentation, it was mid-journey. It was a prompt, actually. It looks like somebody really technical in the photography world (laughs) created an image that I really liked. And I reused that prompt and created something similar. You can really create highly photorealistic images with both mid-journey and with Grok. What I like about Midjourney is it has this kind of a fantasy, magical feel to its images. Grok is also great. Like, Grok is actually very great with 
getting text on images. So I don't even use Canva or anything. Sometimes I want text on images. I just use Grog. I just say, create this image and say in brackets, I put the text grant org, for instance, or proof of concept, for instance, or anything else I want. And it is being so consistent with getting the text on the image. While mid journey, I did the same with mid journey. It couldn't get the orb. It couldn't get the B right. It got ORR. And I tried it multiple times and it didn't do it properly. But act now, for instance, this is Croc, created with Croc. So that may also be one of the questions for you as an organization to say, what matches our brand and our identity? What is most congruent with how we present ourselves already? Yeah. And then there's so many tools. I think as an organization, be a minimalist when it comes to tools. This is, as I said, I've always helped nonprofits embrace technology. I'm a big time minimalist with everything and even with tooling. Too many tools, you might just have too many options and you would not perfect any of that option. If one is working for you, if Grok is working for you, use Grok. I would say go for Grok because, because you can research, you can gauge sentiments around a cause. Like what do people think about? For instance, I've been doing a lot of politics-based gazing of interest and sentiments. But for instance, what, what do people think about the late chat GPT O one and it does a great summary of it. It'll summarize the, this is what's been happening, this is what, and then link the tweets below if you want to dig in further. But it does a really great summary for you. So I find Grok really good because it serves two purposes. It's a chatbot and it is an image generation platform as well. And you can do image analysis as well. They just added the feature like a couple of days ago. So you can put an image and ask it to analyze the image for you. Awesome. We're coming up towards the five, last five minutes. Here's two great comments I wanted to share. So the first one is, it comes in from Laura Turner, who says, a key benefit of paying for some of these AI services is that you can choose if your data is used for future training, which you don't always get that option. Be attentive and aware of what personal data you may be putting into these systems that may therefore escape out into the world. And That's right. I, I turn it off. First thing I do when I buy subscriptions like Cloud and ChatGPT, just turn off. Even Substack, for instance, I have a blog on Substack too. And now LinkedIn, for instance, has also, I think there was a recent update in the policy. And one of it, if you haven't clearly read it, is that your data will be used for training or something like that. And you can turn it off if you want. Those options, these services provide. Just for Grantor, I want to make it clear because I am a social entrepreneur and I Come from the space, I've been always very conscious about how we build Crontorp and we don't use data from day one. And uh, anything that you use, any attachments that you use to ground your grant proposals or grant reports in, we don't save any of those attachments. It's only used at the time of creating and then we don't save it, basically. Great. And two other great comments here. One coming in from Aaron who says, when I use AI generators and the text is just a little off, that sometimes where Canva can work really well. Right. Um, Canva. Another comment here from Giles or, or Gilles is that with TechSoup, you get access to Adobe Express for free. And they often use that for generating AI graphics too. So there are a number of different great tools and opportunities out there. You've got a whole bunch of images or videos you've collected throughout the course of the last hmm. year or on a project. Hmm. Now you want to basically create an, a compilation video that shows the highlights from all of that material. Yeah, Google Vids, I didn't talk about it this time. Uh, Google is going to be coming out with such great tools because as I said, chatbots are great for like getting generic information, expert information, but for tasks, it's difficult, right? Because it ne never gen does things the way we expect it to do on tasks. Uh, but Google has been coming up with really great tools. So one is for obviously understanding complex documents and research papers and stuff. Like it creates it into a really cool podcast that you can listen to and get a whole sense of what's happening. And I use it a lot. It's called Notebook LM and Illuminate. But Google also has something called Google Vids. I can put this in the chat. Check it out. Uh, where basically you take your whole highlights and stuff and co convert it into a video. I bet they will put a lot of AI power behind Google Docs as well. That's something to keep in mind. Like in the future, our using will have AI, yeah, but the thing is a lot of them just slap AI features without thinking through. And then we have AI features that we don't really want. So it has to be really thought through like how it is going to be used. So Google Vids definitely check out and I'll put Notebook LM 
And I also wanted to uh, share a link of my blog on LinkedIn because I have been trying out with all of these tools and posting on that blog about how nonprofits can use these tools and giving them specific use cases because sometimes it's hard to imagine use cases because these are such new tools and we are used to doing things differently. But now how we can expedite what we're doing with these tools and new ways of doing it. For instance, captions, generating captions for your impact report. Show images and say, help me generate like a really compelling two-line sentence that describes this image. And that's such a powerful feature of which of the two images to use in our impact report. That itself is such a cool feature, right? So it's about optimizing for highest impact while communicating what the work that you do. Thanks for coming, everyone. And any questions, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thank you.